Hello Proponomics people and welcome to the Sunday Supplement Summary from the supplement that was published on the 28th of April 2024 and this week it was called Mixed Signals and as you know I like to start them with a quote and the quote I used this week was don't let mixed signals fool you because indecision is a decision and that's kind of a bit of a summary of how I'm feeling about the market at the moment there's been lots and lots of positivity and um, they're looking at immediately backward figures are pretty good um, we should be seeing some pretty good numbers. March was a little bit rocky, rockier than Jan and Feb, but the immediate real time stuff for the economy as a wider whole is roaring really on the services side. Unfortunately, you'll see a little bit later on, but that also means that price inflation, perhaps certainly on the services side, is a little bit more than expected, although there is some positive stuff still going on with energy prices and some goods. Once that's over, my fear is that Inflation is somewhat entrenched in wages, and uh, as it always is, wages are sticky. Everybody knows that's one of the basic things that you learn in economics, apart from anything else. But anyway, this week focused again a little bit on the gilt yields because they're continuing to drift upwards. There was some pretty incredible news out of the US, and basically that was a, a massive miss in terms of the GDP prediction. It was down from 3.4. They were predicting 2.5. They printed 1.6. Um, pretty incredible. And then PCE, which is uh, another inflation metric, which is put together in a different way from CPI. And a lot of the American analysts prefer PCE, although CPI is still what's targeted. Should be clear about that. It was at 2%. It was expected to rebound to 3.4. It actually missed that and rebounded to 3.7. So a really significant miss. But it sees their 10-year bond sort of touching 4.75% yield, which is huge and feels like a lot higher interest rate than the US economy realistically can sustain for the next 10 years as an average. That That is seems like a really, really high print to me. But that's where we are, um, and that's what the market is currently believing. So really, what's it believing? Stronger for longer, or even if there are some, some cuts, maybe they're politically motivated. Of course, the difference in the states, we know the date of the election apart from anything else. We know it's early November, so there's always lots and lots of speculation about how political things would get. And if you've got a Donald Trump running, um, you've already seen what the system will try and do to stop a Donald Trump or to rail against a Donald Trump. So you can expect that if the Fed is going to be political, that might well be what they do. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, the PMI flashes in the UK, the Purchasing Managers Indices, one of my favourite indicators, a really, really hot print, 54.9 for services, 54 overall. Um, that's roaring territory, you know. The headline that S&P Global, who are the people who curate those figures used, was UK flash PMI signals accelerating economic recovery, but price pressures surge higher. So output costs going up, input costs still going up. Obviously, I've been banging on about the minimum wage going up 9.8, which is actually a cost increase of 11.5 when you consider national insurance and pension, apart from anything else. Um, and that's happened. That's happened at the beginning of April. So that's where we are. Not massively surprised. And remember, services dominate the UK economy on the production side of things so much that they're a massive, massive indicator. 47% of CPI, as I always say. Um, the thinking seems to be from, from S&P that we're seeing sort of GDP growth at 0.4% a quarter currently. Looks about right. I think we might have done 0.5 in Q1. March was a little bit more disappointing though, so let's see. And there's some interesting stuff. I used it as this week's graph if you go and check out the supplement on my LinkedIn newsletter or you go and check it out on the Partners in Property website. You'll see the imagery and the image is just showing how closely the PMIs actually correlate to GDP. But of course the PMIs are in real time, so GDP is kind of catching up with that over the next three to six months basically. So the graph gets shifted in a time fashion, but it does show you how, how good a predictor they are. So we definitely know we're outside of that recessionary territory. That's all over. We're still going to see all these headlines when the, the March figures finally drop next month. It would take an incredible reversal in a March to see that. Um, we also know that retail didn't do too well. The uh, distributive trade CBI index was out last week as well, and it missed massively. The prediction was minus two, and it printed minus 44. A much worse April than expected on the manufacturing side of things, on the retail side of things. Um, but... As I say, the sector's rather beleaguered and a pretty small part of the economy. We don't want it to be going backwards, but it's been going backwards 27 months in a row now. Um, big pandemic bump, big come down slowly. But they're still, interesting enough, optimistic over the next 12 months. The optimism index on that side of things printed a positive uh, and the, the long run average is minus seven in terms of that metric. So they look positive for the next 12 months, having got the problems out of the way. We're seeing quite a bit of that commentary at the moment when you read between the lines in places 
you know, the pandemic, le less volatility than there's been. Certainly when it comes to around housing, the market's looking the most normal it's looked since about February 2020, realistically, by a whole number of metrics. So that's that's good news altogether. Um, and, you know, with a lot of graphs, you end up having to ignore 2020 to 2022. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what it says in the final paragraph in the S&P report about the PMIs. It says this is not a rate cutting environment. Um, it's as simple as that, <laughs> you know, suggests that business conditions are more consistent with rate hikes, rate hikes rather than rate cuts. Don't think anyone wants to read that. And that would be quite incendiary if it was more widely published. It was largely ignored by the press. Both the Composite Flash PMI Output Index and Input Cost Index are above their long-term averages and rising. Their words, not mine. Will that be a continuing trend? What it seems to have snapped off is the hiring freezes and all the rest of it. Um, there have been uh, lowest prints for a long time, lowest prints since before the pandemic in terms of paid job ads in March, but April might have seen things pick up. Um, let's see. We also need to see where jobs were cold. We know that factory jobs were somewhat cold when minimum wage moved upwards. Um, it's just incentivizing more automation, I dare say, apart from anything else. That is pretty basic economics, uh, pretty pretty big moves. And then we also look to the consumer confidence, which we always try and look at. Um, minus 19, uh, although that's not a bad print these days. It's not been a positive print since January 2016, unbelievably. Pretty much every metric had moved up since last month. So Moving on reasonably, um, last 12 months didn't turn out to be quite as bad as consumers predicted they would be. Next 12 months, they predict to be quite a bit better. And they've got <coughs> a plus two print on their personal financial situations. That's the same as it was last month. Savings are also bumbling along pretty strongly. So that's not a bad bad news in an inflationary environment. Um, and presumably that incentive finally, once again, save because you might be garnering yourself four or four and a half or even five percent interest rates. Um, is a strong incentive to be saving. What we're going to see is that margin probably being clipped a bit more as lending still completely struggles. And the way this is manifesting itself in the market <coughs> is ultimately that a lot less of the mortgage debt that's being issued is being issued for buy-to-let investment properties as a rule. Because apart from anything else, until the rent increases really continue and or capital prices keep going sideways, if that's what's going to happen, and rents keep going up, Yields obviously improve, yields have improved, but I think at the moment yields really need to be 8% plus for people to be considering buying buy-to-lets. It's as simple as that, uh, unless they're just shoveling lots of money in there, in which case they're not going to get great returns on their money. But just my view, apart from anything else, they won't do too badly because I think capital growth is going to do really well. As I've said over recent weeks, I'm up 25% over the next five years, but I think most of that's driven by the fact that inflation is going to look more like 3%. And it's going to look like two percent as an average over the next four to five years, and I don't see that being being changed particularly quickly. Five years is a long time. We might well get back to target in the the back end of my forecast there, um, but I think we're going to have a sustained period. Bear in mind, first of January 2010 to the 31st of December 2019, inflation was 2.7 percent on average, and no one would have thought that in a decade where there weren't too many inflationary activities. Um, inflation did quite a bit of heavy lifting. Uh, alongside the very low interest rate environment. Now we're much, much higher interest rates and higher average inflation for this decade as well. So quite a quite a phenomenon, really. Um, Five-year guilt yields touched 4.3, closed the week at about 4.25. That's sort of still where I think the top of my range is, but right now yields look expensive to me. They look high. Um, I did say in December they look low. This is pretty typical sort of trading range. I think we're near the top of that range, really, at the moment. Federal Reserve now uh, kind of suggesting or predicting the markets in the US predicting that there won't be a full rate cut until December. Um, so there are people who think they're going to cut before then. But the first time that the forward curve moves down 25 basis points or more is actually for December. Perfectly possible. But as I've been running through over the last few weeks as well, the US has got quite a bit more heat in it than the UK has. Um, the UK is more the laggard effect of wages have gone up later um, primarily because all these things are set in September before and they kick in in the April. So six or seven months in a volatile time makes a big difference. But these costs are still increasing. They're still feeding through into retail, leisure, hospitality and all businesses really. Although obviously higher pay, higher skill companies are not really affected by what's going on in the minimum wage. Maybe a very, very small percentage of their staff, but a very, very small percentage of their of their cost base is their staff anyway because they can be extremely productive 
depending on which services that we're talking about. So what's going to happen on the back of all of this? Well, the north-south divide that we're seeing, which is obviously much talked about, what I'm saying here is properties in the south and the east have been falling in price. Um, Zoopla data kind of backs that up. Not much, you know, 1%, 2%, maybe 3% in some areas, um, whereas properties in the north have been increasing in price because if you are going to invest in property, the money is being driven further up north. North. I saw this myself in my own group investments last year, very much so. We're almost back to business as usual now, but remember, we've always targeted high yield areas, so that's where we are. And then I closed this week with just a little hat tip to the renter's reform bill. Just a reminder, really, investors hate uncertainty. This all needs to be ironed out. We're only at the third reading in the Commons. You need to go through exactly the same process again in the Lords. You've got papers like the Telegraph predicting annihilation for landlords if Labour get elected. The war on landlords is not going to end, blah, blah, blah. Not necessarily helping anything, I don't think. My point is we need great private sector landlords. The institutions are still miles and miles away from picking up the secondary market stock with any confidence in the PRS. Um, something really significant would need to be done around things like rent guarantee and or pushing more people into the social sector who should be in the social sector with affordable rents apart from anything else. But it's a problem because what it does is it creates rent traps and people are stuck there paying 20% below, let's say, what market rent is. And even 20% below now is only the rent from two or three years ago. It is the, it's the full private sector rent from two or three years ago. This disruption to the system and this lack of supply and everything that's going on, layering on top of that uncertainty about whether people can recover properties, you know, and a few nutters bowling around talking about things like rent controls, which you can just see what they've done in Scotland. It's been a complete mess. I've had to pretty much give up on it. And there's 12% rent increases now being unchallenged in Scotland. So it delayed things. Um, <clears throat> but what it also did is it put people out of the market who are permanently going to be out of that market and aren't going to come back. So significantly problematic, realistically. And that's the summary for this week. So thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.